Thanks, Bodily. I'm talking about yeah, once we have constructed yeah, a yeah, photovoltaic generator, we need to be able to actually predict what is going to come off of it. If I am trying to sell somebody on putting in a gigantic industrial scale yeah, installation of one of these things, that might be $500 million. We're asking to put in their first question is going to be a force. Well, what are we going to get off of this? And calculating the power that's going to come off of it is actually a little more complex than yeah, it might seem. You can take a look at the manufacturer's data sheet. It'll tell you what the wattage of it is, but it's going to tell you that at very specific test conditions, we're talking about um, 1,000 watts per square meter of uh, radiance. We're talking about 25 degrees Celsius is the temperature of the module. Uh, a few other standard conditions. And in the real world, of course, that's not something that's going to happen. We have yeah, changes in the atmosphere through the course of the day, weather, yeah, shading effects from other things around the, uh, the installation. You have yeah, changes in the temperature of the module. As the temperature of a semiconductor changes, it's going to change the electrical properties of the semiconductor. And as light is hitting it, it's generating electricity. That's changing the temperature of it with, yeah, with respect to the ambient temperature around it. Of course, the absolute temperature of it, the ambient temperature is changing. Uh, and beyond that, once you once you get past that, the the module is going to generate some amount of current. That still has to make it through all of the circuitry back to an inverter, you have losses in the wiring, you have losses in the inverter, and in the end, you eventually get something out of it, which isn't actually that terribly predictable. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are a number of models yeah, for all of these different components which are used to actually look at the, uh, what we're going to get off of this. And yeah, what I've been working with is the uh, a library that's put out by uh, Sandia National Laboratory called PVLib uh, in order to you know, work to build a model of the you know, array in front of the R1 building yeah, so that we can use that as a, yeah, as a yeah, known thing to take a look at some of these models yeah, and see where there are rooms for, room for improvements on some of these. Um, and also, of course, to be able to actually get a better idea of how that installation is working. Yeah, in addition to being able to predict ahead of time before we've installed something what we're going to get off the theoretical array, you also have a problem of being able to you know, run an array on the grid. You know, the output from a solar panel varies a lot depending on conditions. Throughout the day, a cloud passes over, and if you're running, you know, a yeah, several megawatt array, all of a sudden several megawatts of power simply dropped off the grid. All of a sudden the current flowing through the grid changes direction, things break, transformers explode, and yeah, everybody's in a blackout for a while. Yeah, a few years back, I, I don't know yeah, how many people yeah, remember this, but around the time I moved to Toledo there was a big power outage that uh, Span most of the uh, eastern Canada and northeastern United States, yeah, back to about here, yeah, coming west. I don't think it went much west of here. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there several days that most of us were without power. Uh, the entire thing happened because a tree branch hit a high voltage line, caused a short circuit, and the grid was loaded enough at that time that as things shifted direction, trying to move around. It caused a couple of things to break. A couple of power stations dropped offline to protect themselves, and suddenly the entire grid failed. And that it is, we're moving towards installing more uh, wind and solar power. This becomes a big problem for the grid. The grid has to be able to handle this. So, went to a uh, had gone to a symposium earlier in the spring yeah, from one of the folks from First Solar to come out. He was talking about how they have. Yeah, they have people whose full job is to sit there at some of their installations looking at the weather coming and predicting when you know, they're going to suddenly get cloud cover and all of this in order to be able to start shutting things down gradually in order to prevent you know, dramatic changes. 
uh, in what's coming off of their plant, or else the, the uh, utilities that are connected to are going to get very mad at them. Of course, they have to notify them of that as well. So I appear to be running out of time. But yeah, but at any rate, I, I've been specifically looking lately at yeah, some models yeah, regarding module temperature um, and trying to look at building a, uh, a better yeah, model for predicting that. Yeah. Most of the models that are used right now assume fairly yeah, static conditions. Yeah, and they also follow very closely the irradiance hitting the array, which changes very quickly. The temperature of the module, of course, does not. The module has some heat capacity. It's going to take time to yeah, change as the, the uh, conditions that it's in change. And yeah, a lot of the models that are being used don't predict that very well. But uh, I think I'm really out of time. That stopped a while ago, didn't it? Yeah, it's all right. I'm sorry. All right, let's end it. Yeah. Okay, you're obviously looking at, at multiple factors. Could you just identify which factor sort of provides the greatest degree of uncertainty in making a, a correct or meaningful prediction? Clouds, probably. Um, but also one of the most difficult to actually figure out. Um, the Being able to actually predict the weather is a, a big problem. Most of my work so far has actually not been on the model itself, but actually trying to pull in data to be able to use. Um, I found some historical atmospheric data from the National Climactic Data Center, yeah, which I was able to pull in. Of course, it's in a yeah, text file where every line is, you know, each character means something along the line, and so I had to write a function to actually be able to parse that into something useful. Um, <clears throat> but you also have a problem with spatial res resolution there. Yeah, the closest weather stations to here that actually provide uh, any serious amount of data. You have one over Toledo Express, one at Metcalf Field. Those are each probably about what, eight miles away from here. And one at uh, Toledo Suburban Airport in Bedford Township. <coughs> and so some things are fairly constant over that area. Other things may not be. You know, the wind that it's detecting in a field in an airport is probably going to be a bit different than the wind which is yeah, actually coming across a little yeah, yeah, lawn in front of the building here. Yeah. So yeah, the, I mean, the atmospheric data and the, the weather is definitely the biggest uncertainty. Yeah. Have they uh, <clears throat> ever dealt with stuff and batteries in between, uh, you know, Toledo Edison and your uh, inverter, so to speak, or before the inverter, I should say, to help minimize this, you know, the change <coughs> in, in the um, Well, there aren't any, there aren't any batteries in between the what we're working with over there, yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, the grid. Um, the battery technology is fairly expensive. The biggest benefit that it provides. Um, is probably actually with grid stabilization more than it is with storage of the energy to use later. Everybody wants to talk about you know, hooking batteries to these things so you can use them all night. You can do that, however, the, the amount of storage that you need is rather expensive. Uh, what batteries are good for and what uh, Tesla's been talking about quite a bit with their battery plant where they're now offering house and utility scale batteries is yeah, grid stabilization. Yeah. You know, you can smooth out the, the changes. Yeah. So I, I know First Solar has has been doing some large installations in, in the southwest, I think. These are huge yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, and I think they might have some stabilization mechanisms, maybe not involving batteries, but I, I don't remember. Um, the, well, the only thing I know about that really is what I heard at the colloquium this spring. Um, I don't think he said they had any, uh, any major uh, storage capacity or anything like that. Yeah, but what they were doing, they're actually monitoring, you know, whether 5, 15 minutes an hour out and yeah, shutting down pieces of their array, you know, when okay. they expect a sudden drop in things in order to smooth the uh, transition. Yeah. Which, of course, means you're losing power. You don't get that back. Right. 
Yeah. But he weighs a lot more if it really yeah. Yeah. So you're just not aware of anybody utilizing batteries as stabilization? Oh, that they're system. definitely being used in places okay. like not capacity. common okay. yet because the price of batteries is it's still yeah. a little bit. Thank you. But there are other possible options that people are working on besides batteries, such as hydro storage or... Yeah, yeah. you, you, you can pump water up someplace and then run it back down through a generator. You can use a flywheel or yeah, yeah, super capacitors or things like that. Yeah. None of them are in terribly common use at the moment. And the better model you have of what you're working with, of course, the yeah, better you can deal with the, the fluctuations even without them. All right. Let's thank Dave again. <laughs> and